the MPA, the IFPI, John Gormley, and other corporate media. And today is a, a special day or a special time of the year. Uh, it is the summer solstice, so it is the day of the year when we get to remind ourselves that there is this darkness out there that is coming, and we as a humanity can work together and face that darkness together. And today, to help me face the oncoming darkness, is uh, Steve Kuski. Steve, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. And so, Steve, you are in Regina, and you mentioned that you just got a new job. Do you want to describe a little bit about that job, or just as a general economist type, good enough for the moment? Well, I had several jobs over my life, but uh, right now I'm working for the provincial government in the uh, climate change branch. So I kind of write some briefing notes and review the numbers that go into making the models for forecasting greenhouse gas emissions and things like that. So, starting kind of right at the top on that side, how screwed are we? How hopeless is it from the Saskatchewan perspective, both on the economy side and the climate change side? How dismal of a situation are we facing here? Well, if you're talking about the climate change side, we're just as screwed as everyone else in the world. (laughs) Right. Because we're in one planet, one atmosphere. As for our ability to reduce our emissions, that really comes down to whatever the policies are and how they all kind of play out. It's interesting to kind of look at the... Well, I'm trying to think here. Like, we've got... There are policies in effect for reducing emissions, like from the power side of things. Things are actually looking not too bad. And, and when you're saying power, you mean SAS power? Yeah, well, the electricity generation. Yeah. Like, those emissions are expected to drop quite quickly in the next decade with the phase out of coal fire power. But when you look at, like, most of the, the big kind of issues that they hear about in, like, Ontario and stuff that are, are, like, transportation emissions in buildings and heavy industry. But in Saskatchewan, like, buildings and heavy industry are, count for, are they're like, a tiny fraction of our total emissions. Most of them come from agriculture and, and the oil and gas sector. Right. And cars as well transportation. And so I lucked out when I was in Ontario and I got to see a public talk given by one Sachs who was the former environment steward or she wasn't the minister of environment in Ontario but she was kind of like the person who was responsible for speaking up on behalf of the environment in the Ontario provincial government and Mm -hmm. she was making the point that like most of the emissions in Ontario at least, were point source emissions from individuals and that unlike most places in the world, that it really was the individuals, the households, the people in your life who Mm. that was where the rubber met the road in terms of being able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In Saskatchewan, is that the same way? Is it different? It would be fairly significantly different. Okay. It's it's mostly electricity, which is not an individual thing. It's power, it's centralized power plants. Like, you can cut your electricity down to zero, but it basically is a drop in the pond, as long as there's industry, agriculture, etc. Yeah, if you're looking at electricity usage in Saskatchewan, the vast majority of it is not residential. It's only like 10-15% of electricity. Somewhere in that ballpark is residential. Right. Most of it goes into feeding industry and farms and stuff. And Most of it... Go ahead. Most of those emissions also end up getting exported as well. So of the emissions that are produced in Saskatchewan, like 60% of them go straight into products that are exported. So even if everyone in Saskatchewan produced nothing, did nothing, we would still have like 60% of our emissions just going elsewhere. Okay. Well, because of the the exports, and when, when you say exports, am I imagining things like the oil uh, that we produce? Yeah, the oil. Yeah. Being produced into the gasoline and then burned in cars elsewhere or burned yeah. in trains or whatever the oil is combusted, it's going to be combusted at some point as long as we're pulling it out of the ground here. Mm. Well, it's not just, it's, it's like if you emit CO2 in the production of pumping oil out of the ground, those are emissions that are generated here. But if you just take that oil and just ship it into the United States, it gets burned there. But it's not local demand that is driving the production of these commodities. The right. same with agriculture. We're not eating all the food that we grow here locally, even though the emissions are occurring here. Right. Yeah. And so on that side, there is, we have the carbon tax now, right? And we've mm-hmm. gotten, at least at the federal level, pressure to reduce the production of greenhouse gas emission or however the, the regulation side works. Is that biting into the export side? Is it treating it in the same way? I don't know the, the details on that side. What is, or is it just like purely at the point where the, the oil is burned? Is that where the, well, the, the carbon tax applies, it doesn't apply to large industry, which is, or the oil and gas sector. It only applies for like household and personal consumption kinds of things. And it does 
apply to electricity. That, electricity is really kind of complicated because there's a lot of back and forth between the feds and the provincial government on how electricity is exactly going to be regulated. But the heavy industry is all regulated provincially, and it's not subject to any of the federal regulations. Huh, interesting. And so on the generation side, though, because you mentioned there's a bunch of factors on that are involved with this. What are some of these factors that are causing this that side to be complicated? What? Well, with the electricity, because we've got, there's the federal carbon tax, and then there's the OBPS, the Output-Based Performance Standard, which is the federal program for large emitters and industrial emitters. That in Saskatchewan only applies to SAS Power, whereas we created our own provincial policies for affecting that replaces the federal output-based performance standard for our large emitters in the oil and gas sector. Okay. So other countries like Alberta and uh, like Ontario, they're entirely governed by the feds, and then other places like Nova Scotia and stuff, they're entirely governed. No, I guess you could say like Quebec and. Uh, like BC are entirely governed provincially and other places are entirely governed federally and we're like the only province that's like half federal and half provincial Interesting. which makes our system a little more complicated than in any of the other provinces I could imagine that but like it's interesting that they would even bother with the federal side because the SAS party is usually so stringent on having control over that particular topic right like they sell themselves as the pro-oil party that they have this control at least as far as they're able to keep the federal government from interfering which this is interfering in the the oil and coal industry right if they're Mm -hmm. involved in this well that's why they took them to court oh okay (laughs) and that was the court case you know last year and the federal government tried to regulate the entire province and the federal the provincial government said no you can't do that and then the court case was basically about whether or not the carbon tax is actually a tax because when it was legislated, it was legislated by the federal government as the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. Mm -hmm. And that legislation stipulates that the Minister of Environment has the responsibility to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, but it didn't specify anything. And then when they announced it, they labeled it as a carbon tax. And the provincial government took them to court and said, you can't levy a tax on us because that requires a vote in parliament and it it has to specify in law what the tax rates are. And that's not in the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. Right. So the province was saying that it's unconstitutional because it doesn't, it's, it wasn't voted on in Parliament. And the federal government said, well, we don't need a vote in Parliament because it's a regulation. Mm-hmm. And then the court voted in favor of the federal government saying that it is a regulation, therefore they can still impose it. And then Alberta took them to court and said, well, natural resources and their use is a provincial jurisdiction, but the federal government doesn't have the authority to regulate something that's in provincial jurisdiction because the courts already found that it was a regulatory measure and not a tax. Right. So then the Alberta government found that the carbon regulatory regime was unconstitutional because they don't have jurisdiction to regulate industry <laughs> in the provinces. Okay. And, and so then I found myself thinking that after all that, it was like, well, why didn't the feds just pass it as a tax? They have all the jurisdiction in the world that they need to levy taxes, but they they decided to go with a regulatory measure, which the courts have now decided they can't do. <laughs> so does that mean that the carbon tax is not being applied in Alberta specifically and just in Alberta? Well, the federal government, because Alberta had a carbon tax when Rachel Notley was in power. Oh, right, right. And okay. Jason Kenney came in, they withdrew from it. So the federal government imposed the federal carbon tax or the regulatory measure, the pricing system on Alberta. And then Alberta took them to court. And I don't actually know if it's still in effect in Alberta or not. Yeah, because this is, is starting to get fairly recently, that last... Because I seem to remember hearing they, they appealed it, one of the sides mm. anyway, but I didn't hear what the outcome of that appeal was. So whether a stay was granted to like let it keep going until the appeal went through or what the next step was, because I'd imagine it's going to go to the, if not the Supreme Court, certainly the appeal yeah, either way. Right. It'll go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And so that just that part just hasn't happened yet. And the Supreme Court Mm -hmm. is like, as far as I understand, they're still meeting, but they're meeting online and they're uh, maybe not working as quickly or as effectively because of COVID as they otherwise have been. Uh, Yeah, I imagine that they're going to be slow for a while. So other than that, though, in Regina, is there anything in your world in the, the climate change side or the econ side in Regina specifically going on lately that is worth bringing up? Or is it just purely provincial level stuff? Yeah, I pretty much only pay attention to provincial or global level things. I don't know of anything that's happening specifically in Regina that's climate change based. Okay. Or even economic based. That wouldn't be a broad, you know, unemployment is up, 
<laughs> right. kind of thing. But that's true of everywhere in the world. So For sure. And definitely mm-hmm. it is an issue that we're all kind of facing at the same time and doing different things about, but we're definitely all in the same boat on that one. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as provincially, because we are heading into election season and we've now got the four main parties that are trying to vie for the helm of power in the next provincial election. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. with, of course, the caveat that as part of the public service, there's going to be limits on kind of perspectives that you can emit. Mm. But have you seen or heard anything from, for example, the Wexit party on their climate change part of their either platform or uh, policy or anything like that? And I guess I can't really say like what you think of it personally, but in terms of their policies. I don't know anything about their policies. I haven't looked at them or I focus more on what the feds are trying to do and kind of what the province is trying to do. I don't so much look at political platforms, okay. so I can't comment one way or the other on what they're doing. Fair enough. Sometimes I look at, like, I theorize about ways in which the province could reduce their emissions, because sometimes the politicians will come and be like, well, how do we solve this problem? Go figure it out. Then we'll have to, like, sit down and go, uh, let me see, uh, <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> but I don't know what any of their platforms actually are. Okay, that's that's fair. Sometimes I don't even know what their staff party platform is because <laughs> sometimes it feels like it changes all the time, just on the whim of whatever's in the news one day. We were looking at net zero stuff, not because the province is planning on doing it, but just because Justin Trudeau was talking about it at, at you know, some of these meetings lately. So it's like, well, uh, what does this mean? What's going on? Go look at it. Figure stuff out. It's like, what, what is he talking about sort of thing? What are the yeah. implications to our province if he actually does it? Mm-hmm. Well, net zero is kind of interesting. So, so what? We're pa- pausing there for a second. What exactly is net zero? Is that the related to the feeding back power into the grid thing that was just canceled a little while back, or is this something? Uh, no, not really. Net zero is a greenhouse gas emission target that sets the limit at the amount of sequestration. So there's and, and sequestration zero. is like pulling carbon dioxide out of the air using what the SAS party has been investing in for the past two decades, the carbon capture and storage, if I've got that right. right? Uh, yeah, kind of. Well, mostly sequestration is, like, the way it's measured now, it's, like, sequestration in agricultural soils and in forests, and, like, it would involve, like, atmospheric scrubbing and then geological sequestration. The carbon capture and sequestration plant in Estevan doesn't really count because it's capturing emissions that would have gone into the air. Oh, okay. The way it's measured is it's just not an emission. Right. It's not a, a reduction of third-party emissions from somewhere else. Right. As opposed to the taking the forest and the agriculture where it actually does pull carbon dioxide that would be in the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere, mm-hmm. and then does something with it. But, like, when it does, like, in the case of forests, right, like, it turns into trees, turns into mm-hmm. other greenery in the forest, but then... Mm-hmm. Like, how permanent is that? Uh, does the regulation... Well, that's a uh, highly contentious issue. <laughs> it's argued about in academia as well as in the office sometimes. Some of the arguments are that the trees absorb it, and you can kind of track the, the mass of carbon by measuring the height of the trees and the thickness of the trees and how they change over time. You can track how much carbon is kind of being sequestered in that. But eventually the forest and the trees will die, burn, and that carbon goes back in the air. So they try and net that out, and they look at either land use change, like you cut down the trees and plant crops or something, or you take farmland and rewild it, or just the fact that, especially in the southern forest belt, they've been actively suppressing forest fires for the last 70 years. So the forests are getting older. So as a result, like across the boreal forest, it's been storing more and more carbon over the last 50 years just Hmm. because the trees aren't catching fire and burning down because we've been actively suppressing them. Right. And I read somewhere earlier in the year, so like right at the end of winter when it was still too cold to like, for most people, I think, to be paying attention, but it forecasts that this year would be a particularly bad year for forest fires in Saskatchewan. Hmm. Is that, do you know if that has continued to be something that is being predicted or is it just was made then and then has changed or have that data? I don't know what forest fires are like right now. I haven't been, I'm not in the forest fire branch, but (laughs) I'm in a slightly different group of people. But does your office work with that particular group of people, at least occasionally, to get this kind of data out of them sort of thing? Not usually. Those people generally communicate directly to the federal government, and that data kind of percolates back down from a carbon perspective anyway. 
from a forest fighting perspective, that would also be managed locally. But okay. I don't know those people that do that. Or... Fair enough. So you also uh, were talking a little bit uh, earlier about, this is probably a good place to get into. So there are these licenses or people that allow you to, to kind of work at the federal level, right? Or, or at least work with data from the federal level. There's access. You, uh, you've described even conferences that you've been to in the past and, and kind of other roles. Mm-hmm. But there is information being transferred between the provincial level and the federal level. But one of the other things that you're involved in is the Vision of Earth group. And uh-huh. one of the last reports that was published through them was the global governance, envisioning global governance thing. Mm-hmm. And so that side of things, and we can probably get into more details as we go, but it suggests that there's this a higher level of coordination that's possible. Maybe it isn't happening fully right now, but in terms of, I mean, there's the UN and the IPCC as far as climate change information goes, but are you being fed information or is there anything... Uh, coming from higher than the federal level that is actually impacting your work, or is it just like purely federal plus maybe the IPCC or something like that? I don't think there's much of anything that comes from outside of the federal level and the provincial level. It's mostly just the province and the federal government kind of working together to build our data, and then we just send it to the, the global level, yeah, the UN level. And then so I think if there's anything that we would... Like, sometimes you might take, like, a GDP forecast for the global GDP or something. Hmm. But that doesn't really factor into any of our, our models or anything. It's Like, it did a little bit in my previous job when I was at finance, but it wasn't so much that we were integrating their... Because a lot of their data isn't even directly comparable to our data, just because of the way that they measure it and stuff, so... Right. Yeah, we don't... There's not a lot of global-level data. It's usually all the countries of the world feeding stuff into the global level, and if we wanted that data, we could just get it from the other countries if we needed. Like, it's probably easier to get data straight from the United States than it is to go through the UN to get it, but... Fair enough. Because, like, in the case of climate, this is a, as you mentioned, like, it's a global issue, right? And Mm -hmm. we we need, if we're going to do anything about the carbon in the atmosphere, we have to, on some level, do it. And together with other, never mind provinces, but, like, countries around the world, especially our neighbors to the south. And Mm -hmm. so with what's going on down there, like the Trump opening up the Arctic fur drilling, opening up parkland fur drilling, releasing all kinds of regulations, and I think even like just making a blanket change to the EPA where it's like, thanks to COVID, all regulations are basically not applying to the EPA or something along those lines. So like what impacts do those sorts of things have to the modeling here in Saskatchewan? Is that being taken into account? Or is it just purely like measuring CO2, measuring things locally, that sort of thing? Uh, um, Our models would mostly just use local. The whole objective is to try and make it as local as possible. Because we could use like the federal government's emissions forecasts, which are federal level models that just kind of allocate emissions mostly. Mm -hmm. They do some provincial level forecasting and stuff. But anything that's done provincially tries to make it as specific local as possible but none of those models are actually super super complex okay. if you've got the climate change forecast done by like the big universities or East Anglia or you know any of these kind of like they would be using a much more sophisticated models we just basically use their data and if there's something that is specific to Saskatchewan probably just use a little local model specifically for that one kind of metric we don't have a big globe spanning model for forecasting stuff even when it comes to the greenhouse gas emissions, we use the federal model. The federal government makes the model. We just provide them with the variables that they input into the models, and then they run the models. So there's only kind of one model in the whole country, and all the provinces just feed information into it. Okay. So and that's run at the federal level. Now, that brings up an important point, which is that is there any attempt to vet what the federal level is doing with the data that you're giving them? And like, is how sure can we be that the output of their grouping and taking all this data and having some output from it, that that's done in good faith and not in some way of just pulling something from a hat, but like with prejudice to the prairie provinces or something, right? Because I, I can especially imagine like that the oil industry will be interested in finding such a thing if it exists. So like there's the the fact that they haven't really got any smoking gun on that is probably a little bit of evidence that they're doing it in that good faith. But because there's only that one place where that calculation is happening, is there any vetting or is it just purely the Saskatchewan government trusts the federal government to do the right thing? Well, there's a fair amount of vetting. Like, it depends if you're talking about, like, the NIR, like the National Inventory Report, which is the 
historical emissions that are calculated and gathered and submitted to the UN as part of the of our commitment to the Paris Climate Accord, Paris, but all of the climate accords going back to the 80s, mm. the COP1 meeting <laughs> way back in the day, and the emissions forecast, which go out to like 2030 and stuff like that. In all of the cases, we've got provincial data that's going there, and then they kind of do up their first draft, and then they send it back and we look at it and we comment on it and point out all the things that we think are wrong and we send them a multi-page report kind of thing and then they look back at it and they kind of assess, take our comments and look them over and then they make tweaks and changes and they send it back again and it goes back and forth several times between like just our province in the Fed but also all the other provinces in the Fed and we're all looking at this from 11 different perspectives and try to come to a solid number that we kind of all agree on. And okay. then that number gets sent to the UN. When it comes to the forecast, it follows basically the same process. In some ways, I think some of the same people are involved too. So it's, we send them our assumptions, they incorporate it. They took, I know, because I wrote most of the, the feedback that we sent last time, and I wrote a big blurb on population growth assumptions and stuff like that. And, and they just accepted basically everything that I said last time. So that was kind of cool. It makes me feel like people are listening to me when I, te- <laughs> when I say something. I, I remember in like previous in your, your career that that wasn't as much the case, where like you were coming up with these ideas and getting that kind of capital of like reputational value. But I don't remember as much people kind of listening to you on that side. So it's cool to hear that. Uh, you're, you're making the waves on that side too now. So I wasn't trying to convince anyone in my old job. I was just reporting on what was happening. People would read it or not read it or yeah. it was different. So, so yeah, yeah, there is, there are feedback mechanisms and it goes back and forth several times in the process of figuring out what the numbers probably should be. They're not, we don't always agree. And there are, you know, big kind of notes in our the briefing notes we send up that we think these numbers are good and we think these numbers aren't as good. But we argue them and make note of it. Okay. And so, because, like, there's definitely climate skeptics out there. And there's people that are seeing this process, at the, especially the UN level, and not trusting it. And not trusting the, the output of it, not trusting the science of it. But, like, you, the way you put it is, like, there's 11 of these provincial level Mm -hmm. units that are doing the research coming up and coming to almost a consensus on that level. And I mean, we have conservative provinces. So does that include Alberta then, for example? Yeah, they would be converting. They would be discussing with the feds as well. They would would not be paying attention to really to what the other provinces are reporting, so Mm -hmm. long as it's not wildly inconsistent with what Alberta is doing. Because Alberta wouldn't know, like, well, how much oil is Saskatchewan producing they would know how much Alberta is producing because they're the ones collecting the royalties and they're the ones doing all those measurements. But there's also multiple different organizations that are doing all those measurements. Okay. So you've got, like, the, the provinces all do it because we collect royalties. Then you've got, like, the Canadian Energy Regulator, which was the National Energy Board before. They're looking at this stuff, too. And then you've got Natural Resources. Canada is looking at this stuff. And then you've got the industry associations are looking at this stuff. And we're all mashing all this data together to try and figure out what is the actual, because they're always a little bit different. Right. <laughs> but yeah, they generally are accommodating and trying to figure out. There are active efforts at a bureaucratic level to make the numbers as accurate as possible. Okay, that's good to know. And like, especially since like in the court case, or at least I think it was the Saskatchewan law, one where they took the the carbon tax or the carbon regulation or whatever to court mm-hmm. where they in court they the Saskatchewan government acknowledged climate change was real acknowledged mm-hmm. it was man made acknowledged the status quo science is roughly correct and I really wasn't expecting them to do that given their political campaigns will tend to be oh the carbon tax is our, our number one campaign promise is to basically get rid of it right and mm-hmm. so it was interesting to see that, and especially if, like, the, on the Albertan side, if their data has to be at least close, right? Mm-hmm. Different, but close to our data as far as what's happening to them, because that, that will mean that they've kind of accepted at least that far. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of good to know. But going back to the, the global governance thing, so from your perspective, what was that about? Because you were one of the people named in that report. You were involved with that. What was the general thrust of that for people who have never uh, heard of it? Governing ourselves report? Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago now we did that. Uh, oh, what was the thrust of that again? Uh, just that we need to basically work together to... There's a lot of stuff in there on like effective altruism and... Uh, 
it's been too long sort of thing. It's been a while. I remember that, like, subsequent to that, I've had additional thoughts on just kind of, like, endogenous versus exogenous governance systems. It was kind of independent of that. Okay. I know that my memories of what's actually in that report are probably inaccurate now. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but, but like, as far as the endogenous... Ex- endogenous and exogenous. So, so what does that mean, and how, how do you see that? Uh, well, the way I was thinking about that was that I was looking at, like, the human body, or just, like, bodies or cells or anything, and just like, well, how do you go from being single-celled organisms to a multicellular organism? What tools do you need for that to actually function effectively and it kind of came to the conclusion that you need a one set of rules for governing how all the cells interact with each other and a completely different and independent set of rules for how they interact collectively with things that are outside of the organism okay and then i was thinking about like well if you look at like the human body if you look at your body my body how does that manifest itself and i kind of had this thought that well you're exogenous nervous system would essentially include your brain and your skeletal nerves and your muscles and your five senses and that whole system exists solely to interact with the outside world and then you have a completely separate nervous system that coordinates all the actions that are going on inside of you your stomach digesting your your heartbeat your breathing your heartbeat your all that other stuff and even if you're like completely paralyzed, your stomach will still digest food, Hmm. your intestines will still work, and there's all kinds of coordination that needs to go on to make all that stuff happen. But as your consciousness resides within your exogenous nervous system, and because they don't really communicate with each other, you're completely oblivious to everything that's going on inside of you. And the example that I was thinking of at the time was, can you point to your breakfast? Like, where inside of you is it right now? Right. <laughs> Probably don't know. Because yeah, exactly. it's just you swallow it, it goes inside somewhere. Yeah, unless something has gone wrong side. sort of thing. If something goes yeah. wrong, you start learning. It's like, oh, that it's not supposed to be there. There's pain there or something yeah. along those lines. But in a normal yeah. situation, it, as long as things are operating properly, you don't. It just... Yeah, just disappears on the inside and your consciousness is oblivious to it because... Consciousness does not reside within your endogenous nervous system. So, so how would this apply then to the the question of taking something like a state or a, even like a, a mm-hmm. province, independent or otherwise, and then like trying to make it as part of a more global and coherent system of these states or of these national entities? How would that look? Well, I think that the if you look at the world through this kind of endogenous exogenous governance idea that I had come up with, it means that to build a global government. You have to treat, all the countries have to treat each other with the endogenous rules as if we are all different cells in the same body, but all of our foreign affairs apparatus is set up to treat countries as if they are another, so they're part of the exogenous governance system. And that kind of creates a fundamental barrier to actually creating any kind of effective global governance because we're always using our exogenous governance tools, and even internally, to our societies, almost all of the governance tools that we use internally are we're dealing with external threats. To take a, a topical example, you could look at the police force, like the RCMP here in Canada. They are not a system for governing internally. It was a system for governing external. It kind of grew out of a paramilitary force, which was sent into Western Canada to pacify the, the native population and make it safe. It right. wasn't to, it didn't evolve organically out of the population. It was sent as an, to pacify an external population. And that, it's also like interesting to note that when we look at the RCMP in terms of this like external or using it as an external force against outsiders, it's as of this year still being used for that. It's still yes. being used against the Wet'suwet'en, still being used in Northern or unceded or otherwise uh, First Nation communities in basically the same way that it was in the very beginning with the Northwest Mounted Police. In mm-hmm. terms of pacifying the <laughs> the external population, that's viewed as kind of a, a threat to the central uh, body. But So what would the way forward as far as making it more internal look like? Would it be just like a purely uh, remove and rebuild organically from something else internal, or what would the... I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't... Is it just like a matter of like, like seeing like it you... in that, those terms is enough to like start the ball rolling of dealing with that situation and having a goal that reflects that is that kind of the way forward uh, maybe but it's not just 
I think that almost all of our governance systems have evolved out of exogenous governance tools that have just been largely turned inwards. When you look at, like, even the healthcare system or the justice system. And, like, like even, like, the, the Constitution of Canada, right? Like, I, I don't know if you've ever read it, but, like, if you read the thing, it doesn't sound like it should be doing what it's doing, right? Like, mm. it, it sets up the responsibilities of provinces and federal government, but, like, it fixes it in stone when we know right well that those sorts of things seem to change with time. Like the yeah. amount of uh, dealing with the healthcare system, for example, the provincial and the federal government do fight over this. And there is mm -hmm. this back and forth, this communication going on. And even though I did come across a, I think it was like a court decision basically arguing that what our Supreme Court does and what our court and justice system does, as opposed to being a system of justice or being a system of punishment or being a system of a legal system, it is a conversation between the provinces and the federal government on the topic of what does the Constitution mean. Mm -hmm. I mean, that aside, it, it does seem like there's this back and forth that's needed, but like you said, we've developed out of this first attempt and we're kind of stuck with it right now. So. Mm -hmm. I think that there's kind of a tacit understanding in our cultural zeitgeist that we need a different system for internal governance and external governance. And you can kind of see that manifest in the fact that we have like local governments and federal governments and provincial governments. And they have jurisdictions that are separate, and they're kind of divided along internal functions and external functions. But I don't think that when these systems were created, it was cognizant in their minds at the time that that's what they were doing. Right. I think that they kind of had an, an innate understanding of it, but not a. it wasn't an articulated understanding. But I think that if we're going to... I think that's one of the reasons why we don't have any functional global government is because this idea has not been articulated. And because we're operating with, at a country level as adversaries, it's always going to be an adversarial relationship at the, na at the national level between countries. And it, I don't know how you bridge that gap unless you take an existing kind of local system and kind of scale it up. So one of the thoughts that I had that never made it into that governing ourselves paper, mm -hmm. if I couldn't, properly articulated because I hadn't thought it through enough at the time, was that if you want to create a functional global government, it has to be based on something that's inherently local. And at the time, I was thinking that would be cities. You take, like, municipal governments, you build a giant network of them that spans the globe, and then you have various regulations, legal systems and transportation systems and environmental regulations. You know, if, like like if the world of 50 largest cities all agreed to the same emission standards, well, it would become a global standard because no right. company wants to build a product that they can't sell in the 50 largest cities on the planet. And then you could kind of grow organically, kind of from the ground up, a system of global governance. And I think that's probably the only way that it could work because I just can't see how we would have an endogenous or a functional level of global government that evolves out of countries. Okay, so uh, on that topic, though, like, I do remember in the past, like, year or so, and I think it was during the beginning of the COVID crisis where some of the cities in the United States, at least, were starting to, like, look at what their federal government was doing and going, this isn't good enough for us. Like, we mm -hmm. need to start working with other cities and dealing with this outside of the scope of whatever the federal government does because it's not doing its job. And in that case, it was just enough that they were, the federal level was not acting on it, whatever. But like, it seemed like those relationships once formed on something that needs to be addressed in an immediate short-term context form mm -hmm. kind of like the basis for future work along that level. And I think that was kind of like the thrust of the report, the Vision of Earth report, was that like there's these mm. areas where we can work together. Yeah, yeah, there and was that. It was that. like we, we can leverage that. Here yeah. where we can try and make it so that we can work together in areas where we can't. And, and where we can learn to trust each other. And in this context, it would mean cities working together. And I mean, there, there is the sister city thing. Where like Saskatoon has um, what's that? So there, there a city in Sweden, I believe. I'm blanking on its name. I'm going to think of it probably in 20 minutes. But and then Regina <laughs> has uh, a couple. Of, I, I think there's one or two cities in China that are the sister cities of China. Mm -hmm. Thunder Bay has uh, one in Minnesota, one in Finland, et cetera, et cetera. And like cities around the world have these sister cities. And there is like people who go from the sister city to sister city, and like the city halls are working together a little, but you barely hear about. Right. And it's mm -hmm. 
in most people's lives, not something that really impacts them a lot. But at the same time, it's there. It's something that can be leveraged a little bit. And we're thinking about on that side. And I think one of the interesting things about cities as well is that they tend not to have political parties. It's because politics, like political parties, really doesn't interact with the mundane aspects of the internal functioning of cities, you know what direction your traffic lights go and stuff. It's that, like, politics kind of only really factors in if you're in an adversarial relationship with another somewhere else. Because cities aren't really adversarial internally or with each other, they can cooperate far more effectively. Well, I mean, cities do have a little... Like, there are zero-sum games that cities yeah. do play, right? But none of them are political, really. Or not, like, there's no left or right way to run a city kind of thing. Like, most of the things that cities have jurisdiction over are, like, you know, your water system and your sewer system and your, all that kind of stuff. Cities compete more on, like, sports, it seems like, than, <laughs> than uh, you know, like, I can't see, like, Regina and Saskatoon necessarily competing with each other. Well, I, in, I'm just, like, thinking in terms of, like, when I was in Regina talking with one of the former police chiefs, and how he was like describing the, the Regina approach to crime was to get all the people who would be causing trouble in Regina and convince them to move to Moose Jaw. And I mean, <laughs> that's, it's not Saskatoon, but the same kind of thing applies, right? Where, yeah, like, yeah. You have these attempts by cities to like push the problem to the other city, whether it be crime or pollution or who's got the this kind of externality or whatever, but that definitely happens. And, and then on the converse of that, like who gets the federal dollars or the subsidies to, for example, build the sports arena. Mm -hmm. That's, again, it's a zero-sum competition for the most part. Yeah, all those things do exist. Right. Yeah. But I guess the other important question I would have for that is that if cities did start organizing in this way, and like if these first sister cities and the, the COVID allies, and if this started to grow into bigger factions, wouldn't the city those factions have just by existing a form of politics and would that start to taint the city level politics or would you expect that or is it just like because of what cities do it's there's this force keeping them neutral well that's really difficult to predict like there are net networks of cities right now that are dedicated for like fighting climate change I can't remember what they're called at the moment it's like the, the 50 the, we talked about them a little bit in that defining or that global governance report hmm. but I'm not blanket on its name right now. But I feel it because I think the difference between cities really and countries is that countries are geographic in nature. There are lines on a map, whereas cities are economic creatures. They grow by economic forces, not geographic forces. Hmm. Because all the cities are essentially just nodes in a big, giant global economy, there's more to benefit from cooperation and trade between cities than there is by kind of trying to get your criminals to move to another city. Like, I don't know of any city that wants walls around it. I don't know of any city that wants to blow up all of its roads and railroads that lead into or out of the cities. All cities want more connectivity. They want more free-flowing of ideas and people. Like, if you're Regina, you don't necessarily, you don't want to stop the free flow of people in any capacity, because either you have a labor shortage and you want people to move into the city, or you have high unemployment and you want all those people to find jobs elsewhere so that they're not unemployed in your city so you in like every situation every city wants to have an airport they want to have a seaport they want to have as many railroads and highways there's this and because all the cities want the same thing they all want more connectivity they all want more internet access they all want more they can all work together to achieve these things and to achieve kind of economic growth and prosperity because when one city grows and becomes wealthy it doesn't hurt another city. It, it probably, in most, most cases, cases, helps them, right? So, yeah. You know, uh, there's more people that they can sell things to. You know, if San Francisco gets really expensive, well then, that just encourages people to live where it's cheaper. It doesn't necessarily work on the small community level, but it does work from across big cities. I think there's a, a distinction that needs to be made between large cities and small cities. Regina is a small city. That's right. a small city. You know, all these little towns that are disappearing because their populations are leaving. But that's different from kind of the mega cities of the world. It, it, yeah, it's, it's not Toronto each other. or uh, Vancouver or something like that, for sure. So we yeah. are getting close to the end here. So is there any last thing that you'd like to say to the world that, that you've got the world's attention? Oh, uh, no, not particularly. Have fun, and uh, everything will be okay. Everything always seems to be bad in the present. That's the one thing I've noticed throughout my life is that 
the present is always the most scary time because you don't know what's going to happen. And that's always true at any point in time, no matter how crazy things are. The present is always scary because you don't know what's going to happen. And the past always looks good because you know how it turned out. And the far future is always optimistic because it's far enough that you can make up whatever scenario you want for it. That's a good thought to end on (laughs) as we head into the future, and especially as we start getting darker nights so that we can actually sleep without the sun hitting us 17 hours a day. (laughs) But uh, uh, with that, I will end the show with a song, because we do have a song this week, which this is a thermal and a quarter, a band I've been thinking about playing for quite a while, from their album uh, Plan B, a song called The Steel. And for those of you who enjoyed this broadcast and are interested in seeing it continue, please do consider going to subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff, and I will see you all next week in the future.